Thank you. Out of interest, how many people here have computer science degrees? <laughs> <laughs> and computer science PhDs? <laughs> okay, so um, if you feel during this talk that these sort of mathy logic questions are slightly too easy for you, I would like just to forward you to um, puzzle uh, <laughs> number, um, in fact, it's, it's in the first chapter, and it's the most difficult puzzle in the book. It's called Caliban's Will, and it was invented by Max Newman, who obviously, if you know computer scientists, you know who he is, but he invented the computer with Alan Turing in Manchester just after the war. He did the Newmanry at Bletchley Park, um, and there is his, basically when he was in his mid-twenties at Cambridge, he submitted a puzzle to the New Statesman, um, the Caliban column, and it's fantastic. It's over, it, it is like a piece of poetry, because it's, um, it has so little information but it has just enough to uh, find the answer. So that is something which um, I would say maybe even <coughs> professional mathematicians would struggle to solve, but it will be a pleasurable afternoon challenge for you um, computer scientists <laughs> if you are worried at how easy these puzzles are, because you're definitely the most um, probably puzzle-capable audience that I've ever spoken to. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably about to be destroyed. Anyway, a little bit about me. Obviously, this is my name. These are um, my most recent books. So I, well, I got a degree in maths and philosophy, but then I got sidetracked by journalism. I was a journalist for almost 20 years. I ended up being the South America correspondent for the Guardian newspaper, where I ended up writing a book about Brazilian football. Then I ghost wrote Pele's autobiography. Then back in the UK, I tried to use the skills of a foreign correspondent, which is the kind of the strange, well, the guide of the strange foreign land to write about mathematics. And I see myself as the kind of foreign correspondent in the world of mathematics. You know, I'm kind of mathematically numerate, mathematically, I sort of have a sense of it, understand it, and I try and explain it to people who might not like it, might not understand it. So that was the idea of my first book where I went around the world interviewing people whose lives linked to math in some way um, in order to get across some kind of basic mathematical ideas, the follow up Alex with Looking Glass. Then I did a um, maths colouring book. Essentially, there was a colouring book craze, and I thought, well, maths has amazing images. I got to earn a living. But really, even though it looks like a colouring book, it's actually a gallery of really fascinating mathematical images that I would say probably has more challenging and diverse maths than anything I've ever done. And in the, in the US, where it was called Patterns of the Universe, and was easily the best-selling thing I've done, um, in, in America, we've just done a new one, Visions of the Universe, and that has got math that's got, you know, any maths graduates or PhDs here? Oh, fantastic. So that's got uh, modular forms, um, it's got, you know, lo lots of, my brain's not really thinking about maths at the moment, I think about puzzles, but it's got lots of things that, uh, percolation, statistical physics, these kind of complicated things done as a beautiful maths colouring book. Um, and also, I've just done using my football and my science writing. It's a book for kids, so if anyone here has a child, boy or girl, uh, between the ages of about 7 and 13, and you haven't yet got them a stocking filler, I would say football school, because basically what I do is that I try and explain the world through football. So we have the... Um, it's a school, like the Hogwarts of football, and in the physics lesson I talk about what would happen if you took football and played it on Mars, obviously the issues there with air resistance and gravity. The uh, biology lesson is all about how a footballer makes sure he doesn't poo in the middle of a game, which is what kids wanted to know, and that you need to talk all about digestion and nutrition. There's all sorts of fun things, but we're not here to talk about that, we're here to talk about puzzles. But before we get to puzzles, I'm also known, as well as my writing my books, for inventing a new sport. So loop which is pulled on an elliptical table. <laughs> and I invented this last year and I had one made. And the Evening Standard did a story on this table and they said, I'm surprised Google has put in an order. <laughs> and I remain surprised <laughs> to this day. <laughs> and if any of you work in the facilities department, come see me afterwards. <laughs> but my, probably the, my profile is highest at the moment because I write a maths column in The Guardian. So essentially, it looks like a column, and to all intents and purposes, I'm the maths columnist and puzzle columnist. In fact, what The Guardian have done is that they, uh, 
they've got a thing called the Science Blog Network, and I blog, and I have the tools, so basically whatever I write, no Guardian person sees it, so it's not sub-edited. I have to do the headline, the picture. I choose it, I put it whenever I want. It's quite a lot of freedom. And so, so quite often at the bottom in the comments, they say, oh, typical Guardian subbing. You know, can't believe this, the, the journalist did the headline. But the article was very good. Um, so actually, I, 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 I did it all, which um, is probably why I'm here, here today. So I have one on maths. And that started about five years ago, and every couple of weeks, if there's something interesting happening in the world of maths, I put it down, and that, I would say, this is something like probably the most read maths blog for a major newspaper in the world, but it probably is the only <laughs> maths blog in any major newspaper in the world. But sometimes I do really well, and last year, last April, so what, what, you know, I wake up in the morning, and I feel like I'm doing your advertising for you. And I have like lots of Google alerts for all these little mathematical things that come to me. And I read them. And last April, there was one that said something like, a puzzle in Singapore causes a something or other. And I was like, what's this? And it turned out that a presenter of a local program in Singapore had seen a question that was in a Singapore maths exam and had put it on his Facebook page. And the, like, the local paper had picked it up because he was like a celebrity talking about maths. And I thought, man, that is quite a difficult question for a primary school Singapore kid. But actually, because um, we, you know, Singapore, they're always top of the tables. This thing of Singapore maths, they're reinventing how to teach primary school maths. I thought, my God, they're so good, they can do this problem. Um, so I just put on my, well, it was, it's Alex's Adventures in Numberland, my maths blog, and I just said, you know, it was like, are you smarter than a ten-year-old Singaporean or something like like that? Can you do this puzzle? It took me about five minutes to do. It's probably the shortest article I have ever written. It's quite easily the most successful thing I have ever written in like now 30 years of journalism. <laughs> because within a few minutes, it was in the hundreds. By the hour, it was tens of thousands. By the end of the day, it was over a million. And by the end of the, um, the week, five million people had looked at this puzzle. So it's the Cheryl's birthday problem. I'm not going to do it now because you need to sort of look at too many things and sort of, sort of write it down rather than do it in your head. But that was picked up. I, w I was on the BBC. It was the number one story on the BBC. It was the number one story on the New York Times. Blah, 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 blah. D didn't talk about how bread it was, but rather how amazing that a puzzle can go viral in a way. You know, it was the year of that dress. And it was kind of the maths of that dress. It was a thing that you saw it and you wanted to see if you could do it, you could, you could share it. And that gave me the idea. So they gave me the idea. I've always been thinking it'd be fun to do something on puzzles, but that made me think, man, I've got to do puzzles because there's a hunger for it. Whatever the, the reasons for it, people do love to do them. They love to share them. Maybe it's because they want to find out how to do it or more likely because they can do it and they want to prove they're smarter than other people. Um, I don't know which side you guys sit on. Anyway, so because of that, I started to do a new puzzle every two weeks in the garden. It's Alex Bell's Monday puzzle, and there was one this Monday, so there won't be one this Monday, there'll be one um, week on Monday. And that's been going now, <coughs> there must be 40 odd puzzles there a year. No, more than that, it's been going a year and a half. And as a result of that, I wrote this book. So this book, it contains maybe 5% of the puzzles in this book are from the column, but because of the column, I ended up just like going and reading all the old puzzle books, going to the British Library, you know, opening old puzzle books, sort of blowing the dust off them, trying to, what I wanted to do was not just have a book which is a bunch of puzzles, um, I wanted to use the fact that I'm a journalist and I'm the foreign correspondent in the world of maths to kind of tell some sort of stories with them. And the stories that I ended up telling really, um, I've divided it into five different types of puzzle, and within each of them I tell the kind of the historic story of that genre of puzzle. And each of the way through, quite a lot of puzzles are invented, then reinvented, then rediscovered, and they have really interesting uh, stories of the devisers or of how they've maybe inspired some mathematics, or maybe there's a mathematician who's then kind of inspired something in culture. So what we're going to do today, I'm going to talk for maybe about 40 minutes, we're going to do some puzzles, then you can ask me some questions. And let's have some fun. Okay, so I can say lots of people here got early and started to look at the book and maybe even on the back page, which is not what you should be doing to enjoy the first puzzle because it has the answer on it. So turn around now. We're going to actually do the puzzle on the cover. 
Okay, this is a lovely little puzzle. And I should want to stay in the middle. It's not easy for the cameraman. Um, it's an odd one out puzzle. We all know odd one out puzzles. One of these is the odd one out. Okay, you're super intelligent beings. You just looked at it, you've watched it out. I'm going to go through from here, which is quite interesting. So I do this to a different audience, just seeing. So often puzzles are a lot about psychology as well as they are about logic. And actually, it's the interplay between psychology and logic, which is, underlies lots of puzzles, but also underlies magic, which is about um, getting that kind of the psychology that's just right. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Who thinks here the only small square is the odd one out? Great, two people. Mm -hmm. Who thinks it's the only blue one? Really good, about another two. Equal. Who thinks it's the only circle? Three. Who thinks it's the only one with no border? Okay, okay so, so normally what happens when I have less intelligent audience <laughs> <laughs> is that by the time I've got to the only one with no border, everyone puts their hands up and they think, because everyone's too scared to, to, to go earlier on. And then what you do, so these are all the people who have already put their hands up, you say, just think and remember what I have actually just said. This is the only one which is small, the only one which is blue, the only one which is a circle, the only one with no border. What is unique about that one? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. That shares, every element of it shares uh, aspect with something else. So therefore, by not being unique, by not being an odd one out, that one is the odd one out. So rather than being a puzzle, you could really consider this as a subversive campaign against odd one out puzzles, because <laughs> the odd one out is the one that's not the odd one out. Okay, so let's, let's carry on. I'm going to do, rather than go into like Big puzzles that take a long time. We're just going to do some kind of rapid fire ones. So some you might like, some you might not like. And because I like words, because I'm a writer, I thought we'd do a word one, word wizard. What do the following words have in common? Assess, banana, dresser, grammar, potato, which is like, a bit like a banana, revive, uneven, voodoo. They all contain letters. <laughs> they all contain letters. Top of the class. Oh, this, this is going to go very fast, this talk. <laughs> yeah, basically what you do, and quite often I say at the beginning of this, this is the puzzle that even children can do. And when you say a puzzle that even children can do, basically that means it's nothing to do with meaning. Because quite often people look at this and they're trying to look at the meaning. But yeah, it is just looking at the patterns. And even though it's kind of obvious when you actually see what the pattern is, you take away the first letter and they're all palindromes, are the same back to front. Sometimes it can be quite hard. You, you can see there's some pattern going on. It can be quite hard to actually see the pattern. So um, it's the sort of thing that's, either you get it, you don't get it. You think, why didn't, I, why didn't I see it? OK. So where do puzzles come from? Puzzles, well, we've been, <clears throat> I think, have been trying to unpuzzle the world ever since we've been able to sort of be, be conscious of it. But the first sort of mathematical, logical puzzles are probably about 2,000 years old, and they come, the, the earliest ones were the earliest ones I could find that were interesting enough to put in the book uh, <coughs> for it come from China. So, what you have in the so the, the earliest writing that we have is from Babylon. We have sort of cuneiform tablets. There's loads of stuff on maths there. I mean, interestingly, there's a lot more stuff we know from Babylon than we do in terms of written material from later civilizations like Egypt, because they all had it in stone, and so it, like, it lasts rather than papyrus, which doesn't last. And there are lots of maths and lots of kind of sums in them, and there are some sums which are obviously kind of recreational and fun. But we don't actually know what the puzzles might be. We could just tell it's a piece of math that's used to do something fun. The f sort of most important person in the early history of puzzles would be a British man, Alcuin of York. So Alcuin of York, to does anyone, heard, I mean, he should be a kind of household name to mathematicians, but he probably isn't. Um, what he, he um, 
was a pupil and then a teacher and then the headmaster at the cathedral school in York. And he became known as like turning it into like the top school in Europe. And he was headhunted basically by Charlemagne to run education for Charlemagne. So he actually had to go to Rome for some kind of religious thing to see the Pope. Um, and on the way, he was intercepted by Charlemagne's people, and they said, come on, come to Aachen to run our educations, which he did. So he went to um, Aachen, taught Charlemagne, taught his court. He, um, this is the first ever European-wide system of education, which was in kind of churches around Europe, which predates the university system. He also invented joined-up writing, so his scribes could write faster. He's a fascinating guy. He also... Um, <clears throat> He wrote a lot, was the first person to invent some kind of punctuation squiggle for the question mark, which is quite nice, seeing his role in puzzles. So once he'd left um, Charlemagne's employ, he became the abbot of Tours in France. And in 1799, he sent Charlemagne a letter which said, you know, dear um, emperor, um, I'm sending you some arithmetical amusements, some arithmetical problems to amuse you. And these amusements, which are no longer with that letter, that it still exists, but a hundred years later, lots of s examples of these 50-odd puzzles appeared in different places, and it's assumed that the puzzles that he was talking about were these ones from hundreds of years later. So even though um, there's no absolute proof, they're known as Alcuin's puzzles, and they're called the Proposiciones um, de Aquendos Jovenes, I apologize for my Latin pronunciation, which is the problems to sharpen the young. And not only is it the largest, I mean, it's kind of revolutionary in so many different ways. It's the first time that humor is used to sell maths. It's the first time that any new mathematics appears in Latin um, ever. So it's the earliest, even though it's way after the, um, the Roman Empire is gone, it's the earliest Latin new maths. And <clears throat> well, because the Romans, they did lots of things with maths, but they didn't actually do the kind of thinking about it, 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 stuff. And um, it contains some of the kind of cl world's classic puzzles and, uh, and problems. So it, its most famous one is one that I won't do here, but because you will all know, and it's actually quite an easy one to solve, which is about the man who arrives, or traveller who arrives at a river with a wolf, a goat, and a bunch of cabbages. Um, the wolf eats the goat, the goat will eat the cabbages. So how do you get them all across in a boat where you can only take one thing at the same time? And that is something which is, you know, say, so why is that mathematics? Well, it's logic, really. It's logic. You need to, there's only one way you can proceed um, to do it. It's a funny setup, but also you learn something. And that's the best thing about some of these puzzles, is that they kind of isolate something interesting about the mathematics, and they just present it in a really nice way. So you actually learn something which, um, about kind of using your wits in the sort of general world. And what you learn about that is that in order to get everything across, you need to take something across, take it back, and then across again, which is maybe a kind of a wider moral. And that puzzle, you know, I like to say, and sometimes I do say, that maybe the puzzle that went most viral sort of in the world with my Cheryl's birthday puzzle because it went to millions of people within like 24 hours. But if virality is about getting everywhere um, and not really about speed, the wolf goat cabbages puzzle is probably the most viral one. It was obviously only spreading um, at the speed of the media at the time, which is people walking around and telling each other. But um, there's a text from the 13th century, so this is 400 years later, that says every child under the age of five can solve this puzzle i.e. it's just known by everyone. And you will be, you know, now this puzzle is not studied in logic or math, it's studied in anthropology because it's a folk riddle that basically inhabits kind of almost every society um, in the world. What I thought I would do, I would start with another one of Alcuin's puzzles. So this is also, um, you know, 1,300 odd years ago, which is another kind of classic. And it's very easy to state and it's funny, but also, slightly mangles your brain. If two men marry each other's mothers, what is the relationship between their sons? Another thing about a good puzzle is that you don't need to have 
any sophisticated technical knowledge. The only thing you need to know to solve this is you need to know uh, what, happened, the, what marriage is and what childbearing is. I think we all understand that. And even though it's not a particularly difficult puzzle, to try and do it in your head, it's, it's like almost one little bit too much to contain without forgetting the original thing. So it's quite nice and teasy. Anyway, um, can anyone just straight away think of that without having looked at the answer in the book and say what they think the answer is? It's not cousins. Um, the top marks would be to say tenths. <laughs> OK, well, let's try and solve it. The way we solve it is well, let's try and write a, um, uh, not a, a, fa yeah, a family tree. Equals is marriage. It's going to go from the top um, old to the new uh, young at the bottom. So let's call them Albert and Bernard. They marry each other's mothers. Albert marries Bernard's mum. OK, so Bernard's mum is also the mum of Bernard. But Bernard's dad is not mentioned in the puzzle. So we get that that's, that's all we get. Um, then Bernard marries Albert's mum. OK, what more can we say? We know that, OK, so the first marriage gives us Steve. And Bernard and Albert's mum, they say, give us Trevor. So basically, we need to know what's the relationship between Steve and Trevor. And we can see there it's basically step-uncle or step-nephew. But they are obviously nephew and uncle to each other, because we could have started with Bernard and Albert. It's, it's the same both ways. So they are uncle and nephew to each other. Now we've got this quite interesting family, let's see the other funny things that it might reveal. So if you look at Albert, obviously Albert had a mum, which was Albert's mum. So Bernard is married to Albert's mum, but he's also married to his step-grandmother. So he's step-grandfather to himself. <laughs> and you might think that's hilarious, and this is a kind of medieval craziness. But I don't know if you can remember, um, there's an actual family that this actually happened to. Um, <laughs> Bill Wyman and Mandy Smith, and you can remember. So if we start with Mandy's mum, gave birth to Mandy, who married Bill. Then Bill's son, Steve, married Patsy, Mandy's mum. So Bill Wyman was gra step-grandfather to himself. <laughs> so when you think, oh, these kind of crazy medieval things, it was even crazier around about, about, about now. OK, so I'm going to do a sort of historical sweep a little bit. So now let's move on to the 17th century to talk about this guy, William Whiston. So Whiston was an interesting chap. He's a mathematician. He was the successor of Isaac Newton as the Lucasian Professor of Maths at Cambridge. And he did some kind of interesting things. But he became most famous for his religious views. So he didn't believe, he was a you know, devout Christian, but didn't believe in the Holy Trinity, believed it was a kind of a, a duality. Basically, he didn't think that Jesus was as on the same level as God, so you couldn't call it a trinity. And for this, he was declared a heretic and banned from Cambridge. So he spent the rest of his life basically making money from giving mass lectures in the sort of new kind of coffee house scene of London, where he was known to just always diverge into kind of religious rants, talking about his religious beliefs. And the other thing about him is that he was one of the foremost campaigners for the Latitude Prize. The Latitude Prize was a prize that the British government was going to give to the first scientist who could vent a way for working out latitude. No, longitude. The Longitude Prize is one or the other. <laughs> um, it's like people in, in you know, the, the biggest error is a minus when it should be a plus, or a longitude when it should be latitude. The Longitude Prize, he basically was one of the loudest voices for the government to start the Longitude Prize, kind of because he thought he might win it, <laughs> and he never did. But that was all about sort of going around the world. He also, um, he's not really known for this, but when I was doing the research, I discovered that he is the originator of one of the best known mathematical puzzles. And it is contained in a kind of observation. And so when he was uh, Lucasian Press of Maths, he published his version of Euclid's Elements with his notes on it. And one of his notes, he spots this interesting thing which says a question. He basically says, look, look, look at the answer. He, say, he says this, a man walks around the circumference of the world. Ah, uh, he walks around the world once like this. You know, you've got to, it's, a, it's a mathematical world, so there are no oceans or 
jungles or anything, you can actually, and it's totally flat. How much further does his head travel than his feet? Which is, a re again, really nice, like interesting. Hmm. I wonder. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to shout out. Normally I might shout out in a less a smart audience, how much do you think? But I'm going to get like, the exact uh, answer to like five decimal places if I did it here. So let's just <laughs> carry on. So the interesting thing about this is obviously kind of some kind of interesting answer. So let us solve it together. Um, I don't know if you remember you know, circles and stuff, so we're going to have to do a bit of maths. Anyway, it'd be fun. This is essentially what the question is asking. We've got an Earth, which is a circle, as a sphere. So cross section is a circle. R is the radius. That's our man walking around the Earth. His head is the big circle. His feet is the small circle. Revision notes. The circumference, circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. OK, got that? Good. This audience, straight away. Um, so we're back to this one here. So essentially what we need to do is work out the distance traveled by the feet, which is 2 pi r. The distance traveled by the head, which is 2 pi r plus h, which is 2 pi r plus 2 pi h. So the Difference is going to be 2 pi h, which is 2 times 3.14 times, say, 1.8 meters, which is 11 meters. And I think the reason that that is interesting is it's really not very long at all. If you think about it, we're walking around the Earth. The Earth is approximately 40,000 kilometers. The head is going all the way back, it's going all the way over there, <laughs> it's doing all this extra movement. It's just like 11 meters. I mean, this room is what, 11 meters? It's just like, it's crazy. It seems like nothing at all. Well, that's one interesting thing. But the other, even more interesting thing, I need to find another word for interesting, because I can repeat it a lot. The difference is 2 pi h. Okay, it makes absolutely no reference to the size of the Earth. In other words, if you were um, on a football, and you walked around the football, your head would move, uh, would travel 11 meters more than your feet. If you were on Jupiter, and you did the same thing. If you're on the sun, if you, were, if you imagine the entire universe as a kind of big circle and you walked all the way around it, your head would only travel 11 meters more than your feet, which is kind of amazing. OK, that is not the way that the puzzle is normally phrased. The puzzle is phrased in a slightly different way because it really bring out, and this is another good thing about puzzles, is they kind of reinvented, people work out what is the interesting thing about it, what is the surprise. It's always nice if we can have a surprise in our puzzles. It's called the rope around the earth. Who here has heard about, you, yeah, so, so like a good, you know, you're math people, so, you know, you're my people, so you've heard about the rope around the earth. But there's, and even though this is, when you explain it, the math is a bit nicer, the original statement is a bit more confused because a rope lies tightly around the circumference of the earth like right yeah, you're going to get it you can extend it by one meter so the rope is going to be one meter longer but you're going to somehow raise it up so it's got the same it's based so it's, it is again a circle with a center at the center of the earth but it's, every point is the same point above the ground okay yeah so the 40,000 kilometer rope is expended to 40,000.001 kilometer so a tiny tiny bit this rope is extended, and it's now raised above the ground. What size of animal could crawl underneath? You're supposed to think, if you're not mathematicians, well, it's a tiny amount, like, I don't know, an ant? Or maybe, maybe a beetle? Um, well, let's do the math. So we've got the Earth, the radius. We've got the, 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 the rope, which is the circumference. The rope, when it's pulled up from the Earth is the rope plus one meter, and that's the h. We're looking for h. So we know the circumference is 2 pi r. We know the circumference plus one is 2 pi r plus h. Put all that together, we get one equals 2 pi h. So h is one over 2 pi, which is one meter divided by 6.2 h. It's about 16 centimeters. So 16 centimeters, what's about that? That's quite a lot, if you think about it. If you're raising it the same amount all around the world, so probably the biggest animal that could go underneath it is that. And I think people do find that to be such a counterintuitive thought, that you have this ginormous rope, you extend it by such a fraction, and yet you could have uh, billions of dogs going around underneath it at the same time all around the Earth. It's kind of, kind of amazing. Now, 
Again, if we go back there, there's no mention of the radius of the Earth. So, by extension to what I said before, if we had a rope around a football, or a rope around Jupiter, or a rope around the Sun, or a rope around the entire universe, and we extended it by a single meter, you'd be able to get those dogs underneath it. It make, it, the actual size of the sphere makes absolutely no difference. So that's the easy part. And one of the things that to me is unsatisfying about that puzzle is that just say you did have a rope that somehow was all around the world, taut on the circumference of, 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 the, the, of the globe, and then you could somehow add one meter to that rope. And if the whole purpose is to get animals underneath the rope, you're not going to try and work out a way to raise it at exactly the same amount all the way around the world. You're going to raise it at one point. So this is what we're going to do. What size of animal can get under the rope if you have a rope the size of the Earth, the, 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 the circumference of the Earth, this rope here, you can add one meter to it and you hold it up and this is the basically what the equation that one how to solve it so the rope's going all the way around and you're pulling it up h we want to find out h and out of interest well let's let, let's start it's going to be it's going to be bigger than a dog okay because we know we can do dogs could do it when you do it on the side it can be bigger than a dog who thinks that um a horse be able to get under it. A horse. Okay, how about an elephant? I should be getting successfully less people putting their hands up, but I'm getting more people. Well, how about, okay, I'm not going to tell you quite yet. How about a giraffe? That's the tallest animal. The actual answer is when you have a rope that goes around the earth, you add one meter to the rope, you pull the rope up at one point, is 20 giraffes, okay? <laughs> to solve that, you need to be, uh, do a bit of um, trigonometry if you want to know how to do it, it's in the back of my book. It's basically the height of center point. It's almost exactly the height of center point. And it's kind of interesting. Okay, let's move on to the 19th century. So the 19th century was a massive growth time for puzzles. One reason was because it was a growth time for, um, sort of for journalism and print, print, because you had like newspapers, you had magazines, it's the kind of industrial revolution, you could make these things, people wanted to read them. And uh, what, the most famous person, or, or the person who most famously made maths fun in the 19th century would be Lewis Carroll. That was because of Alice's adventures in Wonderland and Alice through the, uh, through the Looking Glass. He was also obsessed with puzzles and he wrote loads of puzzle books, but they never did particularly well because they were like far too difficult. He just didn't quite get it right. What he got right so well with his fiction, didn't quite get right with, it, with his puzzles. But he did, towards his later life, invent or was the first person ever to do a puzzle that involves people who tell the truth or people who lie, like truth tellers, which I think, um, I mean, if you're all computer science people, I'm sure that the entirety of computers, learning computer science is full of these things when some things tell the truth, some things tell the lie. And essentially, this is the puzzle that he thought. I've put different names in there because of something that relates earlier in the book, but if you get to this, um, and this is based on the paradox of the, the Cretan, the liar's paradox. He realized he was playing around the last paradox and he realized that you can actually get an interesting solution. So I thought, who here hasn't done a degree in computer science or mathematics? Great. So I want three of you and you're going to be Berta, Greta and Rosa <laughs> and we're going to solve it together. Okay, three, three, three of you, come to the front. Come, I need to have some. Well, you can do it. You can come. But three people, please, please. Right. Come on, you, you can you stay here. And you come here, three of you. So this, this, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get right next to each other. Right next to each other. Yeah. One here, one here, one here. Okay. So you're going to be Berta, you are Greta, and you are Rosa. Okay? So when you try and solve this type of puzzle, 
you basically need to start off and you need to um, like assume some truth values and see if it works out. And basically you're trying to eliminate, I can't believe I'm trying to like telling you what you are like, have PhDs in, you want to eliminate what is a self-contradiction to be left with the only consistent system. Okay, so Berta, let's imagine that you are telling the truth. You're telling the truth. You say that Greta tells lies. So if you're telling the truth, that means you must be a liar. So you're gonna just put this on. This is a Pinocchio <laughs> nose, which is the universal symbol for being a liar. So you're a liar. You say that you tell lies. You tell lies. <laughs> but you're a liar, so you must be telling the truth. Okay, but if you're telling the truth, you say that both of you tell lies, and that's a lie. So that's a contradiction. Okay, so they can't have that. So we can eliminate the fact that Berta is telling the truth. Berta must be telling a lie. <laughs> so you're telling that. So you, you can take that off. So if you're telling a lie, and you say that you are lying, that wrote, sorry, that Greta is lying, you must be telling the truth. Okay? So if you're telling the truth, therefore you must be a liar. Okay? And if you're a liar, is it true that both Berta and Greta are telling lies? No, it's not true. It's tr so it is a correct state of affairs. So with you being a liar, Berta being a liar, Greta being a truth teller, and Rhodes being a liar, is a consistent system, and we have solved the puzzle. Round of applause. <laughs> For Berta, Greta, and Rosa. Thank you. While we are here with Pinocchio's and noses, this is another quick fire one, test your bent and arithmetic. Pinocchio's nose is five centimeters long, imagine it is. Each time he tells a lie, his nose doubles in length. After he tells nine lies, his no ugh, he's told nine lies, his nose will be roughly the same length as a five seconds to think about it. One, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm gonna go through the audience. Who thinks one domino? Who thinks two tennis racket? Who thinks three sunuka table? Who thinks four tennis court? Who thinks five football pitch? Wow, <laughs> this is the first time. Any, so the art, the, 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 well, let's, let's, let's go through and I'll explain <laughs> my reactions. Okay, what the, and this is actually a vindication of what I often say to school children. So, Basically, what we're having to do, we're doing five centimetres, which is double nine times, which is two to the nine times five, which is 512 times five. And what I tell children is that you should know your multiples of two up to two to the 10, because two to the 10, 1,024, which is like really kind of, kind of nice. And that should be sort of, it's like knowing the capitals of the world. The mass version of capitals of the world, you've got to know your doubles up to two to the 10. And I say, and if you want to go work for Google, for example, <laughs> you're going to have to know how to do that. And this is now proved because basically everyone instantly knew that 2 to the 9 is 512. So 512 times 5, you can just swap the units. It's 5 times 5 meters, which is 25 meters. Um, in fact, you guys were wrong. 25 metres is not a football pitch. It's a tennis court. And how do you know that? You know that because, well, this is how I think about it. A football pitch is quite often in a stadium where you have a 100 metre track. So it's basically wherever else you have something that's like a 100 metre ruler. Basically, football pitches have that ruler. So that is going, football pitches are about 100 metres. And so 25, it's a tennis court. So all you, the minority actually of people were there, but you, you so, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's interesting the way that maybe the psychology of always going for the biggest one because it's kind of the biggest surprise, but actually this time you was wrong. Okay, now we have another follow-up question. Pinocchio's nose is initially one inch and has a weight of six grams because that is the um, proper weight of it. And is attached to a 4.18 kilogram wooden head and remembering, after each fib, it doubles. After how many fibs would it break? Obviously, you're never going to work that out because I need to know about physics. I'm not interested in physics. Um, it's 13 fibs, but it gets to a length of 208 meters. I just thought, since we're on the subject of noses being doubling, and you would be interested that this is actually was worked <laughs> out it's from a scientific paper, and this is the reference. So let's say you didn't actually learn anything in this talk. Okay. At the end of the um, uh, 19th century, 
there were two kind of a, a major puzzle figures, possibly the two biggest puzzle inventors in kind of puzzle history. One was British Henry Ernest Dudeney. People call him Henry Dudeney, but actually his friends called him Ernest because the Henry Dudeney of the time was his wife, who was a famous novelist who used the name Henry Dudeney. That's kind of confusing. Anyway, Dudeney is kind of my hero, and you've all got most of you've got a copy of the book. Um, if you don't have, available all good bookstores. The, um, there are lots of his puzzles because they are lots of things that we assume are uh, puzzles that have been around for ages and ages. They were actually invented by him and you can date them and you can tell the stories behind them. So that's amazing. The other guy was his arch rival, Sam Lloyd, who was a kind of Dudeney version in America. And originally uh, they collaborated, but Sam Lloyd was a bit of a huckster. He um, ended up... The, the kind of clash of characters is very American and entrepreneurial, and they ended up falling out because Dudeney thought that he was sort of breaking the gentleman's agreement and passing off Dudeney puzzles as Sam Lloyd puzzles, and they had a f massive falling out. Anyway, I'm going to do, because it's a much better visual one, a Sam, famous Sam Lloyd puzzle. This is called The Canals on Mars. It's from about 100 years ago, and this is The Canals on Mars. What I want you to do, you need to start at T, then you need to go through, or have we, we want to go through all the canals, back to the beginning, spelling out a sentence in English. You should look at that and work out what is a sentence. Okay, it's a nice historical anecdote. When the puzzle originally appeared in the magazine, more than 50,000, this is what Sam Lloyd said, more than 50,000 readers reported that there's no possible way, yet it's a very simple puzzle. <laughs> okay? When the puzzle originally appeared in a magazine, more than 50,000 readers reported there is no possible way, yet it's a very simple puzzle. <laughs> okay, has anyone not found it yet? <laughs> okay, who wants to have the pleasure of telling me the answer? You said. There is no possible way. I don't know if no one did not spot that. Quite often, almost no one gets that. Or you get this interesting, ah, 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 in an audience as slowly the penny drops. OK, this is sort of a bit sort of geographical. Well, not geographical, it's kind of astronomical, I suppose. But let's do something geographical. I've got some geographical puzzles in the book because even though geography is not really maths, there's maths involved in it, and it's also kind of mathematical thinking. So I want to order the following cities from west to east. OK? Edinburgh, Glasgow, Liverpool, Manchester, Plymouth. OK, Edinburgh and Glasgow in Scotland. Liverpool and Manchester are in the north west. Plymouth is in the west country. And what I'm going to do, I'll do the same thing. I'll go from the top to the bottom. And put your hand up if you think that is the one which is the most westerly. OK, the most westerly. Edinburgh. Glasgow. Liverpool, Manchester, Plymouth. The answer is Glasgow. <laughs> so why is this interesting? This is interesting because obviously we understand the maps that we see all the time as two-dimensional, but the country is not. A, it's in a, a, we're on a sphere. It's kind of three dimensions there, and we stretch. We're actually kind of not, we tend to think that you know, the British Isles is like north-south, like up-down, and we have kind of left and right, but we're not at all, we stretch. So the most westerly point of the UK is not, uh, of, the, of, the, of the island, the main island, is not um, Penza Land's End here, it's Ardnamurchan in Scotland, which is here, which, uh, which is an interesting fact. Um, there's another very similar question if you didn't know that, which is also surprising. So which of the states in America is closest to Africa? OK, so you're going to start off with Florida, and it goes up, with Carolina, then New York, Maine. And Maine is at the top. Now, when you look at a map, it's going to be Florida. Florida sticks out, and it's really south. Florida is the furthest state on the East Coast to Africa. Maine is the nearest, like by far. If you actually look at a globe, America is like really pointing diagonally east. So these things that you just don't get until you actually see it. And that's kind of interesting because you know, when you have three dimensions and when you go to two dimensions, like you lose certain information. Okay, I'm going to 
finish with this puzzle here. And I, nice little puzzle here. I had this here, but I've been shaking, vibrating so much that it came off. Um, basically, I got two glasses. I can't do it. Got two glasses like this. I've balanced a match. How do you get the coin out without letting the match fall? And I'm not allowed to pick up the match, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I could touch the. I could touch the glasses, but. <laughs> so it could do, but how, how would you, how would you do that? You can't guarantee that I wouldn't. Um, it would fall before that. You 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 need to practice that. And uh, yes, that, that, that's a bit, a bit too much skill. <laughs> yeah, you could do it on an infinite plane. How would, you, how would it work on an infinite plane? Uh, that's quite interesting. I suppose you could, but I'm going to ban that because <laughs> that's like using another prop. It's like using another prop. It's essentially a hand, isn't it? It's essentially a hand. <laughs> No, you can't take the match, no. Do a, b b okay, you could drill a hole, but I don't have a drill. You, you, you could do, but then like, I'm just like, shaking. You know, I'm nervous here. I'm full, huh? Can you glue the match to the deck? Okay. The answer... Someone actually had said, but I was pretending to ignore them, the answer, um, before health and safety come and um, take, take me away for like, is you light the match. Come on. How do you light the match without another match? It's a good question. I didn't say you can have it at the match, but I'm not touching it while well, I'm touching it with the fire. And, um, It's not worked. <laughs> I think I've used the wrong word. This is the first time, kind of the first time I'm being filmed. I've done this so many times, and I've it's always worked. This is interesting. So I'm just, I'm just going to show you that it's because of the heat or the nerves, or you, or you've jinxed this. But basically, what happens? And it, as a party trick, it's kind of it's kind of amazing because if you light the match. Maybe it's because I bought these matches in King's Cross because I'd run out of the other ones. This is incredibly embarrassing. <laughs> no, I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to get. I'm going to do it again because I'm determined. I am absolutely determined. Anyway, what is the, the reason why this is a good puzzle is not because it it, it does actually. It is quite hot in here, and I've never done it in so hot. Let me, let me just do this. Because it's when it works. Literally, I've had. Oh, this is not going to work. Is it? Oh, there you go. Can you see that? Can you see that? I, th I think what it is is that I'm too far from it, and you need to start blowing it as soon as it's done, done the thing. Anyway, I'm new to this game, and I'm not a professional magician. The reason why this is a, I like this puzzle. One is that. It's quite a nice finale. It's that it's nothing to do with math at all. It's about some knowledge about physics that when you light a safety match, it actually sticks to glass. Like who knew? Maybe if you studied physics or chemistry, like you knew that. And what makes a, a part of what makes a good puzzle is that you are setting someone off in the wrong direction. Because once you're starting to think of something in the wrong direction, even if the answer is so obvious or so in, in front of you, you just can't kind of unthink what you thought and get in the right direction. So there's another puzzle that, um, and, and you know, we talk about math and logic and you're like computer science, so you're assuming there's going to be some kind of mathematical solution, like there's no mathematical solution, like how on earth could there be? But if you're thinking mathematical solution, sometimes it's very difficult just to take that step back. And um, there's another puzzle that I 
often use, one of the first puzzles I use actually in my garden column, which you probably all heard, it's so kind of famous, it's not even in the book, about the bulb in the attic and there are three switches. Okay, and you need to work out, <coughs> you, you can move the switches, they're either on or off, and you need to do something with the switches, and then you need to go in the room and then s see which of the switches um, is, is connected to the bulb. And the solution is that you need to touch the bulb um, because when you switch a bulb on, it, get, it's, um, it gets hot. It's incredibly difficult to solve because you are set the question as a maths question to do with kind of permutations, and if that's what you're thinking, it's, very, it's just so hard to kind of step out. Um, the only person who has ever solved that puzzle in front of me was Joe Nesbo, the crime writer, who I met at like a books festival. And he said, oh, you're the puzzle guy, give me a puzzle. So I gave him this puzzle. He said, okay, I know exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to make me go in that direction. I'm going to go in the other direction. What is something totally non-mathematical, which is about bulbs? Okay, it's going to be something physical. Oh, heat. I got it. And he did it. And he said the reason why that he could solve it is that's exactly what he does when he writes crime fiction. So crime fiction, you know, you've got to have the guilty person in the book pretty much right from the beginning. Um, the skill is to lead people away, to make people not think that it's there. Because once you have put the, the idea that it's like the librarian, no one's going to guess that it's the, you know, the waitress. So. I thought that was kind of interesting, and also that's exactly what magic does. So there's a kind of link with kind of good puzzles, magic, and kind of literature and writing. Okay, I'm very sorry this didn't work first time. I'm hugely embarrassed. I hope you'll be able to cut that out of the video. Um, <laughs> I've probably got about 10 minutes more to, I can ask you your questions. Um, I can sign your books. I can anything at all. Whatever you like. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have any specific process when you try to create a, a puzzle, and does it change given the audience? So I don't create many puzzles. I've created a few puzzles, but what I tend to do is, as a journalist, I research and I read loads of puzzles and I do them. And actually, I'm not that brilliant at solving puzzles. Um, in the same way that you know, I was okay at maths, but I'm not like a massive genius. And I think that. If you can solve them too easily, you can't find a way to make them... So you've got to kind of struggle at solving them so that you understand the mechanics of it, so that other people are going to be going through that process too. Um, and, you know, who is the greatest maths or puzzle writer of them all? And that would be Martin Gardner, this American. And he was, he was a philosophy... He, he, he could barely do mathematics. And I interviewed him before he died. Um, I went to Oklahoma, where he, where he lived. And he said, yeah, yeah, you, it's like you've, it's not that you struggle with it, but if you really have to think about it, then you're going to be able to write about it really, really well. Uh, the, the slight trouble often with, and I think that lots of kind of top mathematicians have in sort of expressing their ideas, is that like, everything's trivial. Like, of course you should understand it. So this, the, the trick is to get that right bit where there's something in it for the people who get it, but the people who will struggle a bit have also got something to kind of get, get hold of. So another thing that makes a good puzzle is it entices you in so that you've spent enough work in it that you're not going to give up. So that's, that's, that, that, there are a few puzzles that do that really brilliantly. Yeah. Can you say any more about the, um, was it the tab Babylonian tablet or whatever, where they knew it was recreational, but they didn't know what it was. Yeah. How do they know it was recreational and what? Okay. Um, I will the full description of that is in my first book, Alex's Adventures in Numberland. So very good that you mentioned that. <laughs> also available. Um, <laughs> so there is a famous one, and it basically has powers of sevens. And I can't remember. It's like seven. It's like the St. Ives problem. You know, seven sacks and seven cats and seven dogs ate seven blah 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 blah. And it is. It's like. It's, it's seven houses, each, seven houses, seven ca cats in each of the houses. Um, each of the cats ate seven grains of barley. Each of the barley had seven things in them. And you get this 
uh, sequence of increasing powers of sevens was series because they want you to add it. And in all the commentaries it is that this comes in a kind of text which is like teaching people how to, you know, trades people or how to do things, sensible things like divide up loaves of bread and different fractions. And then you have this like completely bonkers question about cats and eating grain. And people just, it seems obvious that that was done in some kind of recreational way, probably because exponential growth, when you think about it, is kind of bonkers. Our brains, psychologically, we can't really understand it. And so maybe this was saying, look, isn't this hilarious that just do this tiny little thing and you add one, and rather than adding one, then adding one, it's just kind of, you know, and, I th and the, the answer, the sum of it is like 3,000 elements. You have like 3,000 items when you've just like done a really small sum of, of, of powers. We're unfortunately out of time, but thanks again, Alex Ballas. Thank you.